if um, listeners pick up one or two skills with it, from within the Spikes protocol and start putting them into action, whatever one works best for you, if it's the, hey, I have a list of to-do items, what's your to-do list item, or uh, using end statements instead of but statements, just integrating or sprinkling in some of these techniques is a is a, a great way for you to test them out and see which ones work best for you. This episode is brought to you by Green Skies Analytics, an audit analytics service provider that works with internal audit departments that have data analysts and are still frustrated with trying to make analytics actually work, aren't getting the expected ROI, who can't break through the communication barrier between the analysts and the audit team, and those that need experienced direction through an audit analytics strategy and process. Those that feel like they've wasted time and money on trainings, aren't getting the value they want, not prioritizing the highest risk areas for the organizations, or have projects that seemingly never get completed. Do you deal with any of that? If you do, go to the show notes of this episode and click the Green Skies Analytics link or go to greenskiesanalytics.com to schedule a call and understand how Green Skies Analytics makes analytics actually work for internal audit. This episode is brought to you by Supervisor. Supervisor is a ready-to-use audit analytics platform that integrates with your ERP and any other systems you have to provide actual continuous monitoring for risk across all your transactions. They have more than 350, that's 350 out of the box checks and analytics to enable your team to perform full population testing, detect multiple types of anomalies and identify potential fraudulent activity. That's gonna give you an unparalleled level of assurance in your financial processes. Built by internal audit and accounting experts so your team can get value from the first day of usage. So imagine having no analytics today, walking in tomorrow, and having up to 350 audit analytics already run. You don't have to necessarily take my word for it though. Uh, Global organizations such as Ikea, Michelin, Lacoste, and numerous others trust Supervisor to enhance their audit capabilities and increase their assurance. This podcast is also brought to you by AuditBoard, the leading cloud-based platform transforming how enterprises manage risk. AuditBoard's integrated suite of easy to use audit risk and compliance solutions streamlines internal audit SOX compliance, risk management, and security compliance. Automate processes and improve execution with Audit Board's purpose-built solution, which is designed to address the most pressing challenges of today's practitioners. Experience the latest in audit, risk, and compliance technology. Visit auditboard.com to schedule your product walkthrough to see Audit Board's award-winning platform in action today. Hey everybody, before we jump into the show, I just wanted to let you know that the Audit Analytics and AI Conference is September 25th and 26th this year. It's all virtual, so no matter where you are in the world, you can absolutely attend. Uh, Recordings are also available, so if you are 12 hours away and don't want to be up at 3, 4, 5 in the morning, you can purchase the recordings. This is the only conference that's strictly about analytics and AI for internal audit. So you're gonna get your practitioners use cases. This thing is practitioner led, save for one speaker that we have this year, but everything, everyone else is your in your peer group, ranging from the largest internal audit data analytics teams in the world, down to the individual contributor who spends, you know, like, hey, I got 50% of my time I can dedicate towards analytics. Each speaker mission is to show you how to actually do what they are talking about. So thought leadership is great, and there will certainly be some of that. But for the most part, it's that's great. We love the thought leadership. Show us how to actually do it. We are currently at 19 speakers and counting. So we're going to add a few more. And you can get up to 19 CPEs if you attend. Check out the link in the show notes, or you can search for Google the audit analytics conference.com and you can register there. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Audit Podcast. I'm your host, Trent Russell, and today we welcome back the Silverlist brothers. Justin Silverlist is the Associate Director of Audit for Oppenheimer, an investment firm, and Jared Silverlist is an internal medicine physician in New York City. We had them on a few weeks ago talking about motivational interviewing, and before I go any further, if you're wondering why we have a physician on as well as an auditor, Justin and Jared in in their respective professions realize that some of these techniques that are kind of applicable to physicians are also applicable to internal auditors. 
And so if you haven't listened to the motivational interviewing one, that's a really good framework and protocol to follow when you're doing your audit kickoff, for example. So go check that out, go listen to that one, take notes. And then when you do your audit kickoff for, you know, any given audit, I would highly recommend just having on your, you know, your printed out piece of paper or your agenda, whatever it is, um, some of these motivational interviewing techniques. So initially we were going to talk motivational interviewing and the spikes methodology with the Silverlist brothers, but we thought it made more sense to break those up into two episodes so we could go into a little deeper dive on each one. So like I mentioned, previous episode, motivational interviewing, consider that during client kickoff, as well as other parts of the audit process, but I think it does the best during kickoff. And then today we want to talk about the spikes methodology. And so this is the spikes methodology was basically developed to deliver bad news kind of in a positive light. And so as you might imagine, doctors definitely need to be able to do that. Um, similarly, in the audit profession, we need to be able to do that primarily around findings. Nobody wants to have a finding. Those can be tough conversations. Um, and so using the spikes methodology is a great way to communicate those findings. So I would recommend similar to if you're going to do motivational interviewing techniques during kickoff and you have that kind of on your agenda or for your, your notes, embedding the spikes methodology to some degree into your current audit methodology. So whenever it's time to uh, inform a stakeholder, audit, T, client, whatever you call them, of a finding that you have that they're, you know, which we can just call bad news, then you might want to have that spikes methodology kind of embedded into uh, your framework so you can walk them through that. Here we go. All right, so last time we had the Silverlist brothers on, we were talking about motivational interviewing, and then we wanted to hit on the spikes methodology also, but for the sake of time, I went, hey, let's keep this deep dive on motivational interviewing and then pick it up. We'll do part two for the spikes methodology. So with that said, we're just going to continue the conversation. Um, Jared, I think it makes the most sense to have you speak to what is the spikes methodology or origination, genesis of it, where did it come from, et cetera. So tee us off with that. And then um, we'll let both of you kind of speak to each one of those letters within spikes, S P I K E S for those that want to go ahead and Google it right now. Definitely. Um, so at reflecting on our conversation from last week and thinking about what our jobs are, there are a lot of similarities between doctors and auditors. And one of those similarities is that part of our job is breaking bad news, whether it's to patients or to clients. And so the spikes protocol is a systematic method of delivering bad news to somebody else. It was developed by an oncologist, a cancer doctor uh, in the 90s down in Texas, and they published their work in 2000. Um, and basically they're, they're arguing for, uh, a way for us as people who deliver bad news to structure our bad news in a way that makes things easier for us to give and easier for the recipient to receive. And so probably a little bit more detail than just kind of the classic thing that I'd always heard was give them some good news, then the bad news, and then sandwich it with some good news at the end. So maybe <laughs> there's some elements in there, uh, the Oreo approach, I guess, but maybe there's some elements in there, but. Um, yeah, let's go into a little bit more detail on this. So Justin, I'll throw it to you. And for the, the audience that maybe didn't hear it last time um, and didn't catch it on the intro, Jared is the physician and Justin is the auditor. Like in real life, we're not playing roles here. Like J Jared's the <laughs> physician in real life. That's his <laughs> full-time job. Justin is the auditor. And we want to get their perspectives on this as, as they both have talked about this in their, in their own career. So with that said, Justin, hit us up. What, what is the S in spikes? What does that look like from the auditor side? Sure. So be, before I get into that, I'll just say that. So S stands for setting up. P stands for perception. I stands for invitation or information. K stands for knowledge. E stands for emotions with empathy. And S is summarize and strategize. So how that looks like from an audit perspective, let's, t let's, we'll start with S. So setting up, um, in, in audit terminology, it's setting up the interview. So setting up that discussion to discuss, to have that difficult conversation about audit findings. So the first thing that I like to do in, in having in having these discussions is always start with a draft report. And that might sound so simple or, or and, and it might sound, you know, something that you should just know to do, but there's a lot of times where there have been reports that aren't clearly marked as drafts. 
And it will confuse an, an audit client to say, wait a second, we, we haven't even talked about these problems and you're already publishing this, what's going on here? So I like to set up that discussion with the, the draft label in mind, whether it's in the water watermark or the header and the footer, I want to clearly label that as a draft report. Um, it shows that you're open to feedback, you're open to having that discussion, and, and you're really setting the tone there with, with kind of marking that as a draft. So that's how I, that's the first part about setting up for me. Okay. And I think for those that are listening, it would make sense, embed this methodology into either your audit management system somehow, or, you know, a checklist of, of things as well. Like the, the draft, I think that's a fantastic, just pro tip right off the bat, make it draft it, it, it for all the reasons that you explained. So I, I love that. All right, Jared, from the, the physician perspective, what's that look like? Yeah, the S, setting up the interview, very similar to what Justin was talking about. A lot, I'll, I'll add to it, though, by saying a lot of setting up, at least in the medical world, is, is nonverbal. I, I ask myself, is this the right time to have this conversation with the patient? Uh, imagine I'm delivering uh, a bad diagnosis to a patient, like a diagnosis of cancer or a diagnosis of an infection or, or something that, that's new and surprising. Um, so I, I ask myself a couple questions. I say, is this the right time to have this conversation? Am I in the busy, crazy emergency room where everyone's yelling and people are screaming and, you know, the guy's walking across with, with no pants on? Is this the right time to have this conversation? I also ask, are the right people present? Uh, am I going to be delivering bad news to somebody who's uh, an older adult with dementia who may not comprehend anything that I'm saying? So are the right people uh, in the room? And then the last thing that I do is, I ask myself, can I comfortably sit at eye level with my patients and have a calm conversation? Um, because I've learned that my body language is reflected in the room. If I'm crazy, if I'm, um, I don't know, bouncing from side to side, my patients are going to be bouncing from side to side. So I, I do a lot of setting up non-verbally, making sure the right players are there, making sure that I'm calm um, and, and making sure that the timing is right. I think what, um, for whatever reason, this popped in my head, but uh, for you, because it might not be cancer, it might not be some infectious disease, something like that, but understanding their perspective, and we'll probably hit on that also later, but I know for me, like I'm super active, I go to the gym pretty much every single day, and so I know when a physician, a physician told me, he was like, hey man, you got something torn in your shoulder, you're probably going to have to go surgery, you know, get surgery. To a lot of people, if you're not active, you're like, oh, well, that kind of sucks. But to me, it was like, that's a huge blow to what I do every single day. And for the physician, it was pretty, you know, flipping. It was just like, yeah, man, you got to get surgery. And I'm like, well, you could have delivered that message a little bit better. Um, do you have to like, does it require discipline on your end, Jared, to, to be able to go like, all right, this wouldn't impact me. It's not cancer, but I could see how this might impact the patient. I need to put myself in their shoes and maybe we'll get to that with the empathy piece a little later, but yeah, I think that really does lead well into the assessing the perception. Yeah. I just basically to, to summarize or answer your question, I think, and this is something we touched on last week as well. Emotional intelligence is the number one, most important thing. I think for both of our careers, assessing where the other person is. And so I, I would believe that it's my duty or the doctor's duty to um, make some kind of assessment in their head. Hey, this torn shoulder may not be serious in that it's not going to shorten uh, Trent's life by you know a certain amount of years, but it is really limiting in the things that he likes to do, the things that he enjoys doing with his day. And so, similarly, I might not want to might not want to break this news if if I wasn't able to set up the interview correctly. Yeah. If it's a crazy environment, I would I would also take that into uh, perspective. Okay, appreciate it. All right, Justin, we're on the P, August through the P. Yeah, absolutely. So P for perception. So in my in my in the audit world, it's going to be assessing the the client's perception. But something else to be interested here is that there are really two parts to to perception in, in the audit world. You have the perception that the client has about the findings that you're giving off, but it's also the perception you're giving off to the client as an auditor. Yeah. So Something I always try to do is have these discussions, these difficult conversations about findings in person. When you have discussions like in like these in person, it, you allow the auditee to see your body language, to to see your your calm demeanor, and, and really get to know you and or get to really see you in that human way. And 
there's something to be said about having that human to human interaction versus having to tell somebody difficult news through a Zoom screen. So I always try to have it in person. I always, and Trent, you and I uh, were discussing this before we started recording, but showing up on time, it, it's so crucial that that you set the, the time, you set the, the day you're going to speak it, and you come prepared and you come on time. So between coming on time and, and making sure that I'm coming prepared with written notes and questions, you really give off that that elite perception that you're there to to have this this conversation and it might be a little difficult but the last thing you're going to do is come off rude or or come off um in in a way where you just it was just this isn't you you blow by this conversation that's not important to you so having those elements is crucial for perception okay i think it's important to note uh you mentioned what we were talking about before the call and being on time we were talking about that because Justin and I both showed up like two to three minutes early. It's not because we were both late, right? Like I was <laughs> talking about being on time. We were right. both on time. Uh, Jared was too. Um, I think that's important to mention. But anyway, all right, Jared, from your perspective, Pete? Yeah, uh, perception, assessing the perception of what's going on. I do this very simply and every single time, usually right after I say hello. Um, I've developed a, a list of one-liners that really work well in, in my ability to connect with patients. And my one-liner to assess perception is, um, hey, Trent, I have a short list of things that I'd like to cover during this visit, but before we get to my list, what's on your to-do list? Uh, I think that setting the interview up like this and assessing your perception of what's going on will give me an idea of what's important to you. So if you tell me, hey, on my to-do list is my shoulders hurting me, this is worrying me because I like going to the gym every day and I can't do my pull-ups, Boom, I already know what's important to you and I already know what you want to address. Ideally, what's on my to-do list and what's on your to-do list would be the exact same. Sometimes there are differences, um, but it's a good way for me to assess your perception of what's going on, what's important, uh, and build a, a bridge uh, before I can, uh, uh, I guess, dump the bad news on you in some way or another. Yeah, very um, perceptive on your part because it was from pull-ups that I messed up my shoulder. Like <laughs> <laughs> one, one other thing that I'll often do is if somebody kind of doesn't have a to-do list, which is very often, um, they're there because they just ended up in, in my office for one reason or another. I'll ask them, um, what was the last thing that any doctor told you? <laughs> so in this way, I take the pressure completely off of the patient for knowing their own medical history and medical problems and all these complex things. And I just say, what's the last thing somebody said to you? Putting all the onus on the person that said anything. And uh, I imagine from an audit perspective, there's a lot of different people saying a lot of different things to a lot of different clients and things can probably get equally confusing as a complex medical record. So understanding what the prior communications have been are an excellent way of uh, assessing perception of what's going on. All right, uh, Justin, back to you. Justin, auditor, back to you. Where, where are we at with the I from your perspective? Sure. So I, in the audit world, we go here to invitation or information. So obtaining the client's invitation to talk about the, these findings. So as I said before or about distributing a draft report, I always, I, I'm always intentional to get them a piece of, get them in, in writing the, these draft findings ahead of the call. Cause then that allows them, be, if they have something in paper ahead of time, it, you open that in, you you present them that invitation to speak, to have that difficult conversation versus if you just show up to that meeting and you're reading a piece of paper of all these things, they might be confused. They might not have, they, you might've caught them off guard. So giving them the time to prepare uh, by, by sending them something ahead of time is, is really important. And to me as an auditor, that's how I obtain the client's invitation to really dive more into the into the findings so you know jared spoke about this but when another thing too is when when you in, intentionally then ask the client to provide their feedback about the findings it, it shows to them that they really care about what they have to say and, and a lot of times you'll see if, if you're practicing these type of communication habits throughout an audit they'll actually start to do things in a more audit friendly way or or voluntarily say to you, hey, Justin, you know what? 
we, we did a great job. And, you know, for the next audit, I, I've started printing out certain files that I, I know will make it more uh, effective and efficient for you in the next audit cycle so that, you know, we're not going back and forth for these certain files. So I know exactly what you're looking for and we can uh, make this go a, a lot more yeah. effective in the next and efficient in the next round. So that's how I obtain information and, and, and the invitation. Okay. Perfect. I love that. Jared. Uh, often when delivering bad news to patients, um, whether it's cancer or a blown shoulder, um, sometimes people like to be the boss of all of that information. And sometimes they like to deflect the responsibility or the burden of the bad information. And so, um, I'll often ask patients, how much do you want to be involved with all of this information that I have? Are you the best point person? Do you have a son or a daughter who you'd rather me talk all the details with? And I just give you the high level stuff. Um, and a lot of patients take me up on that. A lot of people will say, Hey, give me the, give me the, the executive summary of everything and all the little details. You know, my son's the person to go to for that. Got um, I think I, I, I imagine that in an audit, there will be the correct people to speak with, and there will be people who may not be as uh, boots on the ground as uh, as as you need. So, um, getting the invitation, getting the invitation from the right person is key. Got it. Yeah, I think that's very applicable um, to what we do in the audit world. What about the K, Justin? Sure. So that's knowledge and giving knowledge and information. So by giving actionable insights and being very clear about findings, you allow and empower your audit auditee to take the actionable findings that you want them to. So I always like to include a very concise summary in all my draft audit reports and, and even final reports so that the auditee knows exactly what they need to do. And I'm giving them the exact knowledge and information they need to, to take action. So that's what I would say for K. Yeah. Giving knowledge. I'll, I'll tell my patients point blank that my number one goal above everything else is to be transparent with you. Um, I, I want you to trust that as soon as I hear information, as soon as I learn information, whether it's the result of a CAT scan or if it's a blood test, as soon as I know that information, I will transmit that information to you. I'm not hiding anything from you. Everything is out the in the open and we're on the same team. Um, and sometimes that that news will be, hey, the cancer has spread and we're in a different place now. And um, when I set it up as my, my number one goal is to be transparent, nobody's ever mad at me for delivering the bad information. Nobody's ever, you know, that I find that people react much more, um, I guess what I would call appropriately when they know that my job is to be transparent. Yeah, and I think that speaks to what Justin mentioned also and what has been some pretty common advice, I think, amongst auditors is don't wait until the very end of the audit and go, here's all your issues. Like, as it comes up, communicate that immediately, be transparent. Um, right. Even on the, uh, during kickoff, which is kind of what we talked about last time, but during kickoff, like, this is the process. This is why you are being audited. This is how it's going to go, being completely transparent uh, around that. And to take that to maybe another level, I know there are certain folks, and this is kind of a point of disagreement for some folks, and I get it depending on the nature of the audit. Sometimes it's a surprise, we're here, we're going to audit you. And other times it's, hey, you're on our audit plan. Uh, two quarters from now, we're going to be coming in and auditing you in that level of transparency. And I think you can do both, and it makes sense to do one in one scenario and the other in another scenario. But even that level of transparency, which I think uh, on the other side, I think a lot of auditors would disagree with the, we're coming in two months because that basically lets them go, let's go fix everything before they come in. But I think there's positives and negatives to both of that. So anyway, all right. Uh, e is one that I'm especially fascinated about. Justin, walk us through E. Sure. So this is where we have a direct overlap with some of the motivational interviewing techniques. And we talked a lot about empathy and making sure that we, we understand where a client's coming from as we employ motivational interviewing. But with E, emotions with empathy, in these discussions, you have to address the client's emotions too. So we can just broadly say emotions as well. So sometimes the, you, you might deliver a finding and they might not always agree with you, right? So you have to keep that open mindset and, and really remain level-headed and professional and show them that, hey, I, you know, I understand where you're coming from. 
but or and this is also something Jared will talk about, but saying and instead of but. Yeah. So, you know, saying I see that we can imp- you know, you know, you you did this really well. Uh, you you have all these really good things going for you and there's also a way for us to help implement your processes to become more effective and efficient. So, that that's a method I want Jared to touch a little more on, but really ha- addressing the empathy you you get them to to speak about the their findings in a way where they feel comfortable because you show them that you know you can see where they're coming from um and and a lot of the times they they might disagree they might say that a, a finding is not material to them and as an auditor i i'll take that and and really try to dig deeper into maybe what they mean m- more by that um a, a lot of the times they'll just they could say it's not material to them, but if you really ask the why question, if you really understand where they're coming from and why they're saying what they're saying, it could be that that the issue was maybe related to another department, and instead of it not being material, they are, they were just a little frustrated because it it didn't relate to their department more than it, or they didn't re- relate to their department when it should have been covered, you know, in another audit scope. So really digging into that why question is important when uh, addressing a client with empathy and evaluating their emotions. And I think what was beneficial for me on the empathy side as an auditor was when I got PCAOB'd. So when I was in external audit and they audited our audit and that's where I went, oh, this sucks. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, exactly. I don't like this. Leave me alone. You're on the other why side you... of it. Yep. Yeah. Why are you asking me this question? It's so obvious. <laughs> like, no, that's a stupid finding. I don't even agree with that. And that's really where it hit for me and be like, so this is how it feels to be on the other side. I don't like this. Right. Um, yeah. Uh, all right, Jared, on, on your end, I know there was some 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 areas Justin was kind of th- hinting at that you were going to speak a little bit more to. So let's hit on those for sure. Just to your point briefly, they say doctors are the worst patients. Yeah. We hate going to the doctor. It's yeah. A, it's a it's it's the exact same uh, situations, exact same feelings that you feel, exact same emotions, <laughs> maybe. Um, so, so expressing empathy for somebody's emotions is one of the most important parts of this whole process. Uh, trying to be busted your shoulder, I, I would say this is not what anybody hoped for, and it's upsetting for everyone. Um, now, imagine if I said, uh, "Thankfully, we don't need to do surgery, but you're going to be out of town for six weeks and not able to do any of your workouts. What are you going to focus on there? That you're that you're toast for six weeks." Instead, if I if I said, thankfully uh, the injury is not as severe, so we don't have so there doesn't need to be a surgery, and we're going to develop a comprehensive physical therapy plan for you to get uh, back into the gym as soon as possible. Th- there's a there's a huge um, change in how the room feels when you when you change those two sentences that basically say the same exact thing. One of them really really uh, empathizes with somebody's emotions, and the other doesn't as well. Justin, uh, to wrap it up, let's hit on the S, the last S. Sure. So the last S, we talk about strategizing and summarizing. So this is very important to to do as well as an auditor. When we have these difficult conversations and we address an audit finding, it's really crucial that we stick to our word. And we say, we come up with a game plan to say, okay, we found this problem, we agree to it, and we're going to come in a few months to make sure that it's it's validated. But in the meantime, we're going to check in every month up leading until that finding or le- leading until that remediation to ensure that everything is on track. So that's a personal technique that I like to, to employ, but it's really crucial that as you're strategizing this and summarizing this to the clients, you, you are maintaining and staying true to your work. So making sure that you're not waiting until the last day before implementation to ask how their audit issue has been going. So um, with that said, that that wraps up uh, the, the spikes protocol from, from the audit perspective. Okay. And then for you, Justin, do you have this protocol written down to where, hey, I'm, I'm about to deliver this you know issue. Let me S-P-I-K-E-S it. Do you have that written down or uh, at this point, is it intuitive for you to do that and you can kind of pick up on the cues? How does that work for you practically real life? Yeah, absolutely. I think 
a lot of these strategies that spikes employ as well as motivational interviewing were something that I just learned from the time in, in the professional working atmosphere. And as I had these discussions with Jared, it was Jared who really told me, hey, we as doctors actually have these protocols that have been studied and published in, in PubMed articles and different medical journals that really work for doctors. And in my head, I'm thinking, wow, if only auditors knew that there are communication strategies that can also be utilized in their job, it would make everybody's career so much better in our industry. So after having this conversation with Jared, it's really all I can think about as I communicate with clients is how can I be the uh, uh, how can I be the best person here? How can I be almost my favorite doctor? I, I try to think about my favorite doctor I ever had. So how can I be my favorite doctor for now my audit clients? So and employing the motivational interviewing techniques and the spike strategy, the spike str uh, protocol really helps me do those things. So. It, it was a strategy that really came to to light and something that I write down. I have a post-it note where I, you know, I put it on my computer that I, you know, I just write spikes. It keeps keeps that in, in ingrained in, in your head. And there's something about writing things down for me. And, you know, I know a lot of people that really allows things to stick. So I, I would say between having those conversations with Jared and, and really having the, the chance to apply those in the practical work setting has really gone a long way for me. I don't know how competitive you all are as brothers, but uh, Jared, that was a solid close by Justin, the way to summarize it. And so uh, I hope there's some competitive nature. You're like, all right, let me make sure I do this better than Justin. So <laughs> with that said, Jared, if you want to uh, wrap us up with the S in your summary. You know, I, th I think I'm going to wave the white flag here. I don't I don't <laughs> know if I can do it better than that. O other than maybe maybe I'll just add to what Justin was saying and um Hopefully the the viewers don't or the the listeners the viewers they don't feel overwhelmed by memorizing this you know long protocol that's in the medical journal like a lot of that can be intimidating and so if um, listeners pick up one or two skills with it, from within the spikes protocol and start putting them into action whatever one works best for you if it's the hey I have a list of to do items what's your to do list item or uh, using end statements instead of but statements, just integrating or sprinkling in some of these techniques is a is a, a great way for you to test them out and see which ones work best for you. Because this is a framework, and and uh, frameworks are very general, very broad, intentionally so that its users can find what works for them and what works for their patients or clients. I think I think your close complements what Justin said extremely well. And I know for myself, as you guys have been going through this in my head, it's like. How am I going to implement this? Like, am I going to write it down? And with methodologies, protocols, et cetera, whenever I hear them, I usually like go, okay, I, I got to do all this. And then inevitably I go, uh, that's way too much. I can't do it. And then I usually end up quitting it instead of just going, let me just, you know, and maybe even 80, 20 rolling it and going, what's the top, you know, thing, one or two things I need to do that would really make an impact. So um, I think for the over analytical person, that was probably uh, very solid advice, Jared. All right. With that said, Justin, uh, wrap us up. What's the what's the thing you want to leave the audience with? Sure. You know, the, the thing I, I'd, I'd like to leave the audience with is just let the birds fly. Let, let, let life happen. Let everything happen as it does. Keep an open mindset to things because there's going to be a lot of difficult moments in life and, and in the working atmosphere and conversations. But if you have this mindset where you're just going to let it happen, you're going to be able to learn from it and you're going to be able to grow from it and get better. So having that open mindset to change and having that mindset to communication, that will really serve you a, a long way. So really just, just let the birds fly. Yeah. I'm just going to, instead of raising my kid, I'm just going to share that clip with him every now and again. <laughs> it's fantastic. All right, Jerry, close this out. What's going on? I think Justin's uh, allusion to nature is relevant here. Letting the birds fly is different from, uh, staring at your phone screen and you know doom scrolling and all that stuff and so my uh my tip that i hope is is, is taken by some people is to monitor your screen time um, we spend so much time at work looking at computer screens and i give a pass for all work related activities we all need to make money and, and live but I'll, I'll challenge people to assess their non-work activities how many hours outside of your workday are you spending looking at a screen 
and then imagine how many hours you spend sleeping and how many hours of your alive life that alive and awake life that you are looking at a screen uh and so go through your apps if it's reddit or if it's the uh, chess like for me it was chess um set screen timers on your applications 30 minutes for these applications and if you want to do them that's fine but budget some time to do it so set a specific time at the beginning of the day hey later tonight at 7 p.m i'm going to play chess until 7 30 and then i'm done for the day so that's my uh you could let the birds fly and, and watch the birds and feed the birds and run around outside, but but don't be staring at your phone for too long. Perfect. And we talked about this before we hit the record button earlier, but I do want to point people to two resources on that because it's um, an area that I've been very interested in uh, over the past couple of weeks is um, that screen attention, basically, and what it really does to our brains, especially I mentioned the kid, he's five, and like I don't want him addicted to the phone. Like, he doesn't have one screen time, all that kind of stuff. But, um, so two resources for those who are interested, dopamine nation, I believe that's what it's called. I just finished it. I should probably know, uh, as well as dopamine detox, which is like an hour long read, but it's a protocol of, uh, basically how to detox yourself from, uh, the dopamine drag. So when you doom scroll and then you get done and you realize I don't feel any better and actually I feel worse the the science behind that is in these, uh, kind of two books. And I think it's very fascinating and can go a very, very long way to helping people in general in their work and um, personal lives be happier, if nothing else. So, uh, If you spend four hours a day on screens outside of work, that is one quarter of your awake life. 25% to doom scroll. Hey, everyone. Thank you very much for listening to this episode of the Audit Podcast. Whatever platform you're listening on right now, I'm sure there's a subscribe button somewhere, so please hit the subscribe button there. If you're listening through iTunes or Spotify, feel free to go give us that five-star rating. It only took me about 16 seconds to give myself a five-star review, and it really helps to get future guests to come on the show, so we'd really appreciate that. Lastly, be sure to check out the show notes and follow us on all our social media channels on Instagram, on LinkedIn, and on TikTok. Also, if interested, please sign up for our weekly newsletter from the Audit Podcast. Thank you all. Have a great one.